Chapter sixty five of Mr. Sponge's Sporting Tour by Robert Smith Surtees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixty five The Hunt. While the foregoing arrangements were in progress, Mr. Watchorn had desired Slarky, the knife boy, to go into the old hayloft and take the three legged fox he would find and put him down among the laurels by the summer-house, where he would draw up to him all regular-like. Accordingly Slarky went, but the old cripple having mounted the rafters, Slarky didn't see him, or rather, seeing but one fox, he clutched him, with a greater regard to his not biting him than to seeing how many legs he had. Consequently he bagged an uncommonly fine old dog-fox, that wily Tom had just stolen from Lord Scamperdale's new cover at Faggot Furs, and it was not until Slarky put him down among the bushes, and saw how lively he went, that he found out his mistake. However, there was no help for it, and he had just time to pocket the bag, when Watchorn's half-drunken cheer, and the reverberating cracks of ponderous whips on either side of the dean, announced the approach of the pack. "'Halo in there!' cried Watchorn to his hounds. "'Or a dummy, but it's slippy,' he said to himself. "'How about him, plunderer? Good dog! I wish I may be cardinal wise man for coming,' added he, seeing how his breath showed on the air. "'Oikes! Pass him up! I'll be dashed if I shan't be down!' exclaimed he, as his horse slid a long slide. "'Halo in, conqueror, old boy!' continued he, exclaiming loud enough for Mr. Sponge, who was drawing near to hear him. "'Fine as a fox that'll give us five and forty minutes!' the speaker inwardly, hoping they might chop their bagman in cover. "'Yoikes! Rout him out!' continued he, getting more energetic. "'Yoikes! Wind him! Yoikes! Stir us up a teaser!' "'Now go, I think,' observed George Cheek, ambling up on his leggy weed. "'No go, ye young infidel!' growled Watchon. "'Who taught you to talk about goes, I wonder? Ought to be at school learning to cipher or ride in the globes!' Mr. Watchorn not exactly knowing what the term use of the globes meant. "'You call that nothing?' exclaimed he, taking off his cap as he viewed the fox stealing along the gravel walk, adding to himself as he saw his even action and full well-tagged brush. "'Ord oh, rot him! He's got hold of the wrong un. It was, however, no time for thought. In an instant the welkin rang with the outburst of the pack and the clamour of the field. "'Tally-ho! Tally-ho! Tally-ho! Whoop, whoop, whoop! cried a score of voices, and twang, twang, twang went the shrill horn of the huntsman. The whips, too, stood in their stirrups, cracking their ponderous thongs, which sounded like guns upon the frosty air, and contributed their Get together, get together, hounds! Hark away, hark away, hark away, hark! to the general uproar. Oh, what a row! What a riot! What a racket! Watchorn being in for it, and recollecting how many saw a start, who never thought of seeing a finish, immediately got his horse by the head, and singled himself out from the crowd, now pressing at his horse's heels, determining, if the hounds didn't run into their fox in the park, to ride them off the scent at the very first opportunity. The chompin, being still alive within him, in the excitement of the moment he leapt the hand-gate leading out of the shrubberies into the park, the noise the horse made in taking off, resembling the trampling on wood pavement. "'Cuss it, but it's hard!' exclaimed he, as the horse slid two or three yards as he alighted on the frozen field. George Cheek followed him, and Multum in Parvo, taking the bit deliberately between his teeth, just walked through the gate, as if it had been made of paper. "'Oh, you brute!' groaned Mr. Sponge in disgust, digging the Latchfords into his sides as if he intended to make them meet in the middle. "'Are oh, you brute?' repeated he, giving him a hearty cropper, as he put up his head after trying to kick him off. "'Thank you!' exclaimed Miss Glitters, cantering up, adding, "'You cleared the way nicely for me.' Nicely he had cleared it for them all, and the pent-up tide of equestrianism now poured over the park like the flood of an irrigated water-meadow. Such ponies, such horses! such hugging, such kicking, such scrambling, and so little progress with many. The park being extensive, three hundred acres or more, there was ample space for the aspiring ones to single themselves out, 
and as Lady Scattercash and Orlando sat in the pony phaeton on the rising ground by the keeper's house, they saw a dark-clad horseman, George Cheek, old gingerbread boots, as they called Mr. Sponge, with Lucy Glitters alongside of him, gradually stealing away from the crowd, and creeping up to Mr. Watchorn, who was sailing away with the hounds. "'What a scrimmage!' exclaimed her ladyship, standing up in the carriage and eyeing the strange confusion in the vale below. "'There's Bob in his old purple,' said she, eyeing her brother, hustling along. "'And there's Fat in his new Moses and son, and Bouncy in poor Wax's coat. And here's Harry, all legs and wings as usual,' added she, as her husband was seen flibberty gibbetying it along. "'And there's Lucy, and where's Miss Howard, I wonder?' observed Orlando, straining his eyes after the scrambling field. Nothing but the inspiriting aid of Champine, and the hope that the thing would soon terminate, sustained Mr. Watchorn under the infliction in which he so unexpectedly found himself, for nothing would have tempted him to brave such a frost with the burning scent of a game four-legged fox. The park being spacious, and enclosed by a high plank paling, he hoped the fox would have the manners to confine himself within it, and so long as his threadings and windings favoured the supposition, our huntsman bustled along, yelling and screaming in apparent ecstasy at the top of his voice. The hounds, to be sure, wanted keeping together, for Frantic, as usual, had shot ahead, while the gorged pig-palers could never extricate themselves from the ponies. "'Forrard! Forrard! Forrard!' elongated Watchhorn rising in his stirrups and looking back with a grin at George Cheek, who was plying his weed with the whip, exclaiming, "'Ah, you confounded young warmint! I'll give you warmint! I'll teach you to jaw about hunting!' As he turned his head straight to look at the hounds, he was shocked to see Frantic falling backwards from her first attempt to leap the park palings, and just as she gathered herself for a second effort, desperate chatterer and galloper charged in line and got over. Then came the general rush of the pack, attended with the usual success, some over, some back, some atop of others. "'All oh, the devil!' exclaimed Watchorn, pulling up short in a perfect agony of despair. "'All oh, the devil!' repeated he in a lower tone as Mr. Sponge approached. "'Where's there a gate?' roared our friend, skating up. "'Gate? There's never a gate within a mile, and that's locked,' replied Watchorn sulkily. "'Then here goes!' replied Mr. Sponge gathering the chestnut together, to give him an opportunity of purging himself of his previous faux pas. "'Here goes!' repeated he, thrusting his hard hat firmly on his head. Taking his horse back a few paces, Mr. Sponge crammed him manfully at the palings, and got over with a rap. "'Well done you!' exclaimed Miss Glitters in delight, adding to watch on. "'Now, old Beardy, you go next!' Beardy was irresolute. He pretended to be anxious to get the tail-hounds over. "'Clear the way, then!' exclaimed Miss Glitters, putting her horse back, her bright eyes flashing as she spoke. She took him back as far as Mr. Sponge had done, touched him with the whip, and in an instant she was high in the air, landing safely on the far side. "'Hooray!' exclaimed Captain Squad and Cut It Fat, who now came panting up. "'Now, Mr. Watchorn!' cried Captain Seedybuck, adding, "'You're a huntsman!' "'You're over-prosperous! You're over-buster!' cheered Watchorn, still pretending anxiety about his hounds. "'Let me have a shy!' squeaked George Cheek, backing his giraffe, as he had seen Mr. Sponge and Miss Glitters do. George took his screw by the head, and giving him a hearty rib-roasting with his whip, ran him full tilt at the palings, and carried away half a rood. "'Hooray!' cried the liberated field. "'I knew how it would be!' exclaimed Mr. Watchorn, in well-feigned disgust, as he rode through the gap adding, "'Confounded young wagabone! Deserves to be well chased eyes for breaking people's palings in that way, letting in all the rubbish in tail!' The scene then changed. In lieu of the green, though hard, sward of the undulating park, our friends now found themselves on large frozen fallows, upon whose uneven surface the heaviest horses made no impression, while the shuffling rats of ponies toiled and floundered about, almost receding in their progress, Mr. Sponge was just topping the fence out of the first one, and Miss Glitters was gathering her horse to ride at it, as Watchorn and Co. emerged from the park. Rounding the turnip hill beyond, the leading hounds were racing with a breast-high scent, followed by the pack in long-drawn file. 
"'What a mess!' said Watchorn to himself, shading the sun from his eyes with his hand, when remembering his role, he exclaimed, "'Yonder they go!' as if in ecstasies at the sight. Seeing a gate at the bottom of the field, he got his horse by the head, and rattled him across the fallow, blowing his horn more in hopes of stopping the pack than with a view of bringing up the tail-hounds. He might have saved his breath, for the music of the pack completely drowned the noise of the horn. "'Dash it!' said he, thumping the broad end against his thigh. "'I wish I was quietly back in my parlour. "'Hold up, horse!' roared he, as Harkaway nearly came on his haunches in pulling up at the gate. "'I know who's not, Cardinal Wiseman,' continued he, stooping to open it. The gate was fast, and he had to alight and lift it off its hinges. Just as he had done so, and had got it sufficiently open for a horse to pass, George Cheek came up from behind and slipped through before him. "'Oh, you unrighteous young renegade! Did ever mortal see such an uncivilised trick?' roared Watchorn, adding, as he climbed on to his horse again, and went spluttering through the frozen turnips after the offender, "'You've no acquaintance with Lord John Manners, I think!' "'Oh, dear, oh, dear!' exclaimed he, as his horse nearly came on his head. "'But this is the most punishing affair I ever was in at. Pusiasm has nothing to it!' And thereupon he indulged in no end of anathemas at Slarky for bringing the wrong fox. "'About time to take soundings and cast anchor, isn't it?' gasped Captain Bouncey, toiling up red-hot on his pulling-horse, in a state of utter exhaustion, as Watchorn stood craning and looking at a rasper through which Mr. Sponge and Miss Glitters had passed, without disturbing a twig. "'Cast anchor!' exclaimed Watchorn, in a tone of derision. "'Not this half-hour yet, I hope! Not this forty minutes yet, I hope! Not this hour and twenty minutes yet, I hope!' continued he, putting his horse irresolutely at the fence. The horse blundered through it, barking Watchorn's nose with a branch. "'Oh, rot it! Cut off my nose!' exclaimed he, muffling it up in his hand. "'Cut off my nose clean by my face, I do believe!' continued he, venturing to look into his hand for it. "'Well,' said he, eyeing the slight stain of blood on his glove, "'this will be a lesson to me as long as I live. If ever I hunt again in a frost, may I be—' "'Thank goodness! They've checked at last!' exclaimed he, as the music suddenly ceased, and Mr. Sponge and Miss Glitters sat motionless together on their panting, smoking steeds. Watch on then stuck spurs to his horse, and being now on a flat, rushy pasture, with a bridle-gate into the field where the hounds were casting, he hustled across, preparing his horn for a blow as soon as he got there. "'Twang, twang, twang, twang!' he went, riding up the hedgerow in a contrary direction to what the hounds lent. "'Twang, twang, twang!' he continued, inwardly congratulating himself that the fox would never face the troop of urchins he saw coming down with their guns. "'Hang him! He's never that way!' observed Mr. Sponge, sotto voce to Miss Glitters. "'He's never that way!' repeated he, seeing how frantic flung to the right. "'Twang, twang, twang!' went the horn, but the hounds regarded it not. "'Do, Mr. Sponge, put the hounds to me!' roared Mr. Watchorn, dreading lest they might hit off the scent. Mr. Sponge answered the appeal by turning his horse the way the hounds were feathering, and giving them a slight cheer. "'Ord rot it!' roared Watchorn. "'Do let them alone! That's a fresh fox! Ours is over the hill!' pointing towards the Bonnyfield hill. Hoop! hallooed Mr. Sponge, taking off his hat, as Frantic hit off the scent to the right, and Galloper and Melody, and all the rest, scored to cry. "'Oh, you confounded brown-booted beggar!' exclaimed Mr. Watchorn, returning his horn to its case, and eyeing Mr. Sponge and Miss Glitters sailing away with the again breast-high scent pack. "'Oh, you exorbitant usurer!' continued he, gathering his horse to skate after them. "'Well, no, that's the most disgraceful proceeding I ever saw in the whole course of my life. Hang me, if I'll stand such work. Dash me, but I'll quaint the Queen. I'll tell Sir George Grey. I'll write to Mr. Walpole. For it, for it, hallowed he, as Bob Spangles and Bouncy popped upon him unexpectedly from behind, exclaiming with well-feigned glee, as he pointed to the streaming pack with his whip, "'Or oh, dash it, but we're in for a good thing!' Little Bouncy's horse was still yawning and star-gazing, and Bouncy, being quite unequal to riding him and well-nigh exhausted, downed him against a rubbing-post in the middle of a field, 
making a cannon with his own and his horse's head, and was immediately the centre of attraction for the panting tail. Bouncy got near a pint of sherry from among them before he recovered from the shock. So anxious were they about him, that not one of them thought of resuming the chase. Even the lagging whips couldn't leave him. George Cheek was presently hors de combat in a hedge, and Watchorn, seeing him seesawing, exclaimed, as he slipped through the gate, "'I'll send your ma to you, you young humbug!' Watchorn would gladly have stopped too, for the fumes of the champagne were dead within him, and the riding was becoming every minute more dangerous. He trotted on, hoping each jump of brown boots would be the last, and inwardly wishing the wearer at the devil. Thus he passed through a considerable extent of country, over Harrowdale Lordship, or reputed Lordship, past Roundington Tower, down Sloppyside Banks, and on to Cheesington Green, the severity of his affliction being alone mitigated by the intervention of accommodating roads and lines of field-gates. These, however, Mr. Sponge generally declined, and went crashing on, now over high places, now over low, just as they came in his way, closely followed by the fair Lucy Glitters. "'Well, I never seed such a man as that!' exclaimed Watchorn, eyeing Mr. Sponge, clearing a stiff flight of rails, with a gap near at hand. "'No woman, no there added he, as Miss Glitters did the like. "'Well, I'm dashed if it aren't dangerous,' continued he, thumping his hand against his thick thigh, as the white nearly slipped upon landing. "'For it! For it! Hoop!' screeched he, as he saw Miss Glitters looking back to see where he was. "'For it! For it! repeated he, adding in apparent delight. "'My eyes, but we're in first dinger! Hold up, horse!' roared he, as his horse now went starring up to the knees through a long sheet of ice, squirting the clayey water into his rider's face. "'Hold up!' repeated he, adding, "'I'm dashed if one mightn't as well be crashing over the Christial Palace as riding over a country froze in this way. Lord rot it! How cold it is!' continued he, blowing on his finger-ends. "'I declare my hands are quite numb. "'Well done, old brown boats!' exclaimed he, as a crash on the right attracted his attention. "'Well done, old brown boats! Broke every bar and gate!' adding, "'But I'll let Mr. Buckram know the way his beautiful horses are abused. "'Well,' continued he, after a long skate down the grassy side of Ditchburn Lane, "'there's no fun in this, none whatsoever. "'Who the deuce would be a huntsman that could be anything else? "'Dash it, I'd rather be a hosier. "'I'd rather be a hatter. "'I'd rather be an undertaker. "'I'd rather be a pusyite parson. "'I'd rather be a pig-jobber. "'I'd rather be a besom-maker. I'd rather be a dog's meat man, I'd rather be a cat's meat man, I'd rather go about selling a chickweed and sparagrass, added he, as his horse nearly slipped up on his haunches. Thank heavens there's relief at last, exclaimed he, as on rising Gimmerhog Hill he saw Farmer Sanfuan's South Downs wheeling and clustering, indicative of the fox having passed. Thank heavens there's relief at last, repeated he, reining up his horse to see the hounds charge them. Mr. Sponge and Miss Glitters were now in the bottom below, fighting their way across a broad mill-course, with a very stiff fence on the taking-off side. "'Hold up!' roared Mr. Sponge, as, having bored a hole through the fence, he found himself on the margin of the water-race. The horse did hold up, and landed him, not without a scramble, on the far side. "'Run him at it, Lucy!' exclaimed Mr. Sponge, turning his horse half round to his fair companion. "'Run him at it, Lucy!' repeated he and Lucy, fortunately hitting the gap, skimmed o'er the water like a swallow on a summer's eve. "'Well done! You're a trump!' exclaimed Mr. Sponge, standing in his stirrups and holding on by the mane, as his horse rose the opposing hill. He just got up in time to save the muttons. Another second, and the hounds would have been into them. Holding up his hand to beckon Lucy to stop, he sat eyeing them intently. Many of them had their heads up, and not a few were casting sheep's eyes at the sheep. Some few of the line-hunters were persevering with the scent over the greasy ground. It was a critical moment. They cast to the right, then to the left, and again took a wider sweep in advance, returning, however, towards the sheep, as if they thought them the best speck after all. "'Put em to me,' said Mr. Sponge, giving Miss Glitters his whip. "'Put em to me,' he said, hallowing. "'Your gut, hounds, your gut, which, being interpreted, means— "'Here again, hounds, here again!' "'Oh, the conceited beggar!' exclaimed Mr. Watchorn to himself, as, disappointed of his finish, 
he sat feeling his nose mopping his face and watching the proceedings oh the conceited beggar repeated he adding old hogany boots is absolutely going to cast them cast them however he did proceeding very cautiously in the direction the hounds seemed to lean they were on a piece of cold scenting ground across which they could hardly own the scent don't hurry em cried mr sponge to miss glitters who was acting whipper in with rather unnecessary vigour as they got under the lee of the hedge the scent improved a little and from an occasional feathering stern a hound or two indulged in a whimper until at length they fairly broke out in a cry i'll lose a shoe said watchorn to himself looking first at the formidable leap before him and then to see if there was any one coming up behind i'll lose a shoe said he no notion of lippin' of a navigable river downright arm of the sea added he getting off forward forward screeched mr sponge capping the hounds on when away they went heads up and sterns down as before ay forward forward mimicked mr washorn adding you're forward enough at all events after running about three-quarters of a mile at best pace mr sponge viewed the fox crossing a large grass field with all the steam up he could raise a few hundred yards ahead of the pack who was streaming along most beautifully not viewing but gradually gaining upon him at last they broke from scent to view and presently rolled him over and over among them woo hope screamed mr sponge throwing himself off his horse and rushing in among them woo hope he repeated still louder holding the fox up in grim death above the baying pack woo hope exclaimed miss glitters reining up in delight alongside the chestnut woo hoop repeated she diving into the saddle pocket for her lace fringed handkerchief throw me my whip cried mr sponge repelling the attacks of the hounds from behind with his heels having got it he threw the fox on the ground and clearing a circle he off with the brush in an instant tear him and eat him cried he as the pack broke in on the carcass tear him and eat him repeated he as he made his way up to miss glitters with the brush exclaiming we'll put this in your hat alongside the cock's feathers the fair lady leant towards him and as he adjusted it becomingly in her hat looking at her bewitching eyes her lovely face and feeling the sweet fragrance of her breath a something shot through mr sponge's pull devil pull baker coat his corduroy waistcoat his eureka shirt angola vest and penetrated the very cockles of his heart he gave her such a series of smacking kisses as startled her horse and astonished a poacher who happened to be hid in the adjoining hedge sponge was never so happy in his life he could have stood on his head or been guilty of any sort of extravagance short of wasting his money oh he was happy oh he was joyous he was intoxicated with pleasure as he eyed his angelic charmer her lustrous eyes her glowing cheek her pearly teeth the bewitching fullness of her elegant tournure and the thought of the mastily way she rode the run above all of the dashing style in which she charged the mill-race he felt a something quite different to anything he had experienced with any of the buxom widows or lackadaisical misses whom he could just love or not according to circumstances among whom his previous experience had lain miss glitters he knew had nothing and yet he felt he could not do without her the puzzlement of his mind was how the deuce they should manage matters make tongue and buckle meet as he elegantly phrased it it is pleasant to hear a bachelor's pros and cons on the subject of matrimony how the difficulties of the gentleman out of love vanish or change into advantages with the one in oh i would never think of marrying without a couple of thousand a year at the very least exclaims young fastly i can't do without four hunters and a hack i can't do without a valet i can't do without a brougham i must belong to half a dozen clubs i'll not marry any woman who can't keep me comfortable bachelors can live upon nothing bachelors are welcome everywhere a very different thing with a wife frightful things milliners bills fifty guineas for a dress twenty for a bonnet ladies maids are the very devil never satisfied far worse to please than their mistresses and between the whiffs of a cigar he hums the old saw 
Needles and pins, needles and pins, when a man marries his sorrow begins. Now take him on the other tack. Fast is smitten. Oh, hang it! A married man can live on very little, soliloquizes our friend. A nice lovely creature to keep one at home. Hunting's all humbug. It's only the flash of the thing that makes one follow it. Then the danger far more than counterbalances the pleasure. Awful places one has to ride over, to be sure, or submit to be called slow. Horrible thing to be set up for a horseman, and then have to ride to maintain one's reputation. We'll be thankful to give it up altogether. The bays will make capital carriage horses, and one can often pick up a second-hand carriage as good as new. She'll save no end of money by not having to put B to my name in the assessed taxpayer. One club's as good as a dozen. We'll give up the polyanthus and the sunflower and the refuse and the rag. Ladies' dresses are cheap enough. Saw a beautiful gown t'other day for a guinea. We'll start Master Bergamot. Does nothing for his wages. We'll scarce clean my boots. Can get a chap for half what I gave him, who'll do double the work. We'll make beans into coachmen. What a convenience to have one's wife's maid to sew on one's buttons, and to keep one's toes in one's stocking feet. Declare I lose half my things at the washing for want of marking. Hanged if I won't marry, and be respectable. Marriage is an honourable state. And thereupon Tom grows a couple of inches taller in his own conceit. Though Mr. Sponge's thoughts did not travel in quite such a luxurious first-class train as the foregoing, he, Mr. Sponge, being more of a two-shirts and a dicky sort of man, yet still the future ways and means weighed upon his mind and calmed the transports of his present joy. Lucy was an angel. About that there was no dispute. He would make her Mrs. Sponge at all events. Touring about was very expensive. He could only counterbalance the extravagance of inns by the rigid rule of giving nothing to servants at private houses. He thought a nice airy lodging in the suburbs of London would answer every purpose, while his accurate knowledge of cab fares would enable Lucy to continue her engagement at the Royal Amphitheatre without incurring the serious overcharges the inexperienced are exposed to. "'Where one can dine, two can dine,' mused Mr. Sponge, "'and I make no doubt we'll manage matters somehow.' Two pence for your thoughts,' cried Lucy, trotting up, and touching him gently on the back with her light silver-mounted riding-whip. Two pence for your thoughts,' repeated she, as Mr. Sponge sauntered leisurely along, regardless of the bitter cold, followed by such of the hounds as chose to accompany him. "'Ah!' replied he, brightening up. "'I was just thinking what a juiced good run we'd had.' "'Indeed,' pouted the fair lady. "'No, my darling, I was thinking—' "'What a very pretty girl you are,' rejoined he, sidling his horse up and encircling her neat waist with his arm. A sweet smile dimpled her plump cheeks, and chased the recollection of the former answer away. It would not be pretty, indeed, we could not pretend to give even the outline of the conversation that followed. It was carried on in such broken and disjointed sentences, eyes and squeezes doing so much more work than words that even a reporter would have to draw largely upon his imagination for the substance. Suffice it to say that, though the thermometer was below zero, they never moved out of a foot's pace, the very hounds growing tired of the trail and slinking off one by one as the opportunity occurred. A dazzling sun was going down with a blood-red glare, and the partially softened ground was fast resuming its fretwork of frost as our hero and heroine were seen sauntering up the western avenue to Nonsuch House, as slowly and quietly as if it had been the hottest evening in summer. "'Here's old Coppertops!' exclaimed Captain Seedybuck, as, turning round in the billiard-room to chalk his cue, he espied them crawling along. "'And Lucy!' added he, as he stood watching them. "'How slowly they come!' observed Bob Spangles, going to the window. "'Must have tired their horses!' suggested Captain Quad. "'Just the sort of man to tire a horse,' rejoined Bob Spangles. "'Hate that sponge,' observed Captain Cut-It-Fat. "'So do I,' replied Captain Quad. "'Well, never mind the beggar. It's you to play,' exclaimed Bob Spangles to Captain Seedybuck. 
But Lady Scattercash, who was observing our friends from her boudoir window, saw with a woman's eye that there was something more than a mere case of tired horses, and, tripping downstairs, she arrived at the front door, just as the fair Lucy dropped smilingly from her horse into Mr. Sponge's extended arms. Hurrying up into the boudoir, Lucy gave her ladyship one of Mr. Sponge's modified kisses, revealing the truth more eloquently than words could convey. "'Oh!' Lady Scattercash was so glad, so delighted, so charmed. Mr. Sponge was such a nice man, and so rich. She was sure he was rich, couldn't hunt if he wasn't, would advise Lucy to have a good settlement in case he broke his neck. And pin-money, pin-money was most useful. No husband ever lets his wife have enough money. Must forget all about Harry Dacre and Charlie Brown, and the swell in the blues. Must be prudence for the future. Mr. Sponge would never know anything of the past. Then she reverted to the interesting subject of settlements. What had Mr. Sponge got, and what would he do? This Lucy couldn't tell. What? Hadn't he told her where his estates were? No. Well, was his dad dead? This Lucy didn't know either. They had got no further than the tender prop. Ah, well, would get it all out of him by degrees and with the reiteration of her so glads and the repayment of the kiss Lucy had advanced, her ladyship advised her to get off her habit and make herself comfortable while she ran downstairs to communicate the astonishing intelligence to the party below. "'What do you think?' exclaimed she, bursting into the billiard-room, where the party was still engaged in a game at pool. All our sportsmen, except Captain Cutitfat, who still sported his new Moses and son Scarlet, having divested themselves of their hunting-gear, "'What do you think?' exclaimed she, darting into the middle of them. "'That bub don't cannon,' observed Captain Bouncey from below the bandage that encircled his broken head, nodding towards Bob Spangles, who was just going to make a stroke. "'That wax is out of limbo,' suggested Captain Seedybuck in the same breath. "'No, guess again,' exclaimed Lady Scattercash, rubbing her hands in high glee. "'That the Pope's got a son,' observed Captain Quad. "'No, guess again!' exclaimed her ladyship, laughing. "'I give it up,' replied Captain Bouncey. "'So do I,' added Captain Seedybuck. "'That Mr. Sponge is going to be married,' enunciated her ladyship, slowly and emphatically, waving her arms. "'Hooray! Only think of that!' exclaimed Captain Quad. "'Old Hogany Top's going to be spliced!' "'Did you ever?' asked Bob Spangles. "'No, I never,' replied Captain Bouncey. "'He should be called Spoony Sponge, not Soapy Sponge,' observed Captain Seedybuck. "'Well, but to whom?' asked Captain Bouncey. "'Ah, to whom, indeed? That's the question,' rejoined her ladyship archly. "'I know,' observed Bob Spangles. "'No, you don't.' "'Yes, I do.' "'Who is it, then?' "'Lucy Glitters, to be sure,' replied Bob, who hadn't had his stare out of the billiard-room window for nothing. "'Pity her!' observed Bouncy, sprawling along the billiard-table to play for a cannon. "'Why?' asked Lady Scattercash. "'Regular scamp,' replied Bouncy, vexed at missing his stroke. "'Dare say you know nothing about him,' snapped her ladyship. "'Don't I?' replied Bouncy, complacently, adding, "'That's all you know.' "'He'll whop her to a certainty,' observed Seedybuck. "'What makes you think that?' asked her ladyship. "'Oh, um, uh, um, why, because he whopped his poor horse, whopped him over the ears, whop his horse, whop his wife, whop his wife, whop his horse. Regular rule of three, some.' "'Make her a bad husband, I dare say,' observed Bob Spangles, who was rather smitten with Lucy himself. "'Never mind. A bad husband's a deal better than none, Bob,' replied Lady Scattercash, determined not to be put out of conceit of her man. "'Ha, ha, ha, ha! Well done, you!' laughed several. "'She'll have to keep him,' observed Captain Cutitfat, whose turn it now was to play. "'What makes you think that?' asked Lady Scattercash, coming again to the charge. "'He has nothing,' replied Fat coolly. "'Deed, but he has. 
"'A very good property, too,' replied her ladyship. "'In Ayrshire, I should think,' rejoined Fat. "'No, in Englandshire,' retorted her ladyship, "'and great expectations from an uncle,' added she. "'Ah, he looks like a man to be on good terms with his uncle,' sneered Captain Bouncey. "'Make no doubt he pays him many a visit,' observed Seedybuck. "'Indeed, that's all you know,' snapped Lady Scattercash. "'It's not all I know,' replied Seedybuck. "'Well, then, what else do you know?' asked she. "'I know he has nothing,' replied Seedy. "'How do you know it?' "'I know,' said Seedy, with an emphasis now settling to his stroke. "'Well, never mind,' retorted her ladyship. "'If he has nothing, she has nothing, and nothing can be nicer.' So saying, she hurried out of the room. End of chapter 65